All right, that is so precious. Come on. Good morning. <laughs> it's so good to be with you. Thanks, Dave. It's so good to, good to, good to hear your voice to you, bro. Uh, good morning. My name is Matt. I am first and foremost a child of God and a part of his family with you. It's great to be here. Um, I also get to serve on staff. I, uh, am, I oversee our life groups, our young adults ministry, and I get to be a part of the teaching team, which is a lot of fun. Um, it's been a while since I've been up here because I've been on sabbatical. I went on sabbatical this past summer, and then shortly after coming back, uh, we had a baby. And those weren't planned intentionally, uh, but just happened to be that way. Uh, but yeah, we had our little, uh, our second son, his name is Kellen, and him and mama are doing really well. Uh, yeah, woo, 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 woo. And congrats to our new grandparents over here, Saunders. Congratulations to you guys. Uh, I love it. Just the family's growing. Um, Paige and I, I, I wanted to say thank you for all the, the love and the care that we have received from Seacoast, from our family here. Uh, we, I have felt so loved and cared for. Uh, all of the meals, the cards, and all of the different things that people have been dropping by and dropping off at our place. Uh, just, man, some of the meals have been really good. I've been like, girl, let's have another baby, and let's keep this meal train going. Choo-choo! Let's go. Uh, but thank you so much. I mean, just being you guys, being a family that loves and cares is amazing. Okay, we are in Acts. We're continuing on in our series, and so if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn them on, you can open them up, uh, turn or tap your way to Acts 17. That's where we're going to be this morning. I also want to just, uh, yeah, well, Tim mentioned the communion cup, so we'll be getting into that at the end of this time together. Let me pray for us as we jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for being, being present, Lord, being here. God, whatever it is, God, that, that has happened in this past week, whatever's going on in our lives, whatever fears we have, anxieties, even joys, and things that we're excited about, God, you're present in all of that. And so right now, we just want to acknowledge that you're with us. You're here. God, you know exactly what we need. You know exactly what we need to hear. And so, God, would you do this morning by your word, by your spirit, would you do this morning what only you can do? Would you press the truth of your love down deep into our hearts, God? Set us free to be able to experience your love and express your life to our worlds. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we get going into this morning's text, I want to just kind of ask the question of like, what, what does it look like into today's world in today's world, today's climate, with how everything is, what does it look like to actually to live as a follower of Jesus in today's world? What does it look like to share our faith, to talk about our faith in today's climate? I mean, is it even possible anymore to have a fruitful conversation in a world that's just inundated with just, I mean, with opposing viewpoints and so much anger so much fear. I mean, there's a, the world is, and we're watching it. We're seeing everything unravel. We're seeing, I mean, there's so much anger and there's so much fear. What does it look like to live as a follower of Jesus and to, to share about him in today's world? And a lot of that stuff has been weighing on me uh, as, and just in the last, you know, few months. I mean, it's probably just compiled over the last um, couple of years, but what does that look like? And as I was preparing for today's message, it just was such a sweet, refreshing reminder of what really counts, what really matters, what the overall aim is as we navigate this world and, you know, navigate having fruitful conversations, seeking to have those kinds of conversations with so much anger, fear, and opposition. And it really boiled down to me. I'm like, I, God, I just want to I want to know you, and I want to make you known. I know that sounds simplistic, but we're going to see that today. We're going to see that it really does come down to experiencing the love of God for ourselves, and then to express his life to others. We experience his love, and as we do, we can express his life to others. And really, I, my prayer is that we as a church, as a family— here and now, we, that we would reject fear, 
and that we would have a spirit-ignited confidence and boldness and kindness to engage in a world that's really going mad. So we're going to hopefully, you know, the prayers that today, that this would help us understand what that kind of looks like. Because the, the Apostle Paul in this chapter is really, he's laying out what could be a really cool framework for how to engage with people. Um, so let's jump in to the story here. Acts 17, we're going to start with verse uh, 16. But real quick, we just want to set up the context that Paul, he's on his missionary journey that we've been tracing and following over the last or we kind of picked it up again last week. Uh, but now he's in Athens. He's in Athens, and there's a couple things that we just need to know about Athens that kind of helps set the context here that Athens was really the intellectual metropolis of the time. Like in Paul's day, Athens, it was, it was really the intellectual center of the Roman Empire. I mean, it was really ground zero for all of the the breaking out, the breaking ideas of the, like what's the latest, the greatest, and philosophies. Athens was where guys like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, I mean, people that philosophers today study, I mean, this is where they kind of got going and where their ideas began to spread. And so this is where Paul is at. He's at this epicenter. He's at ground zero of all of this intellectual kind of culture. This is where he's at. So it's, it's, he's not in some small little village out in the sticks He's in the city. And we, it's important for us to know that, I mean, he's in the city, that, A, that the gospel is for everyone, but also that the gospel can hold its own in the marketplace of ideas. So let's jump into the story here. Verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, he's waiting for his friends, that, um, which soon meet up with him, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. And so right off the bat, we see Paul, he sees something and he feels something. What did he see? Well, he's cruising around the city and he's walking around, just taking it all in, just walking down the streets. And all of a sudden he sees, oh, that's interesting, it's a little statue. He sees you know, one statue, then he sees like another. It's like, and it's kind of like that moment where you, you see one ant, and then you see a second ant, and then there's 700,000 of them. You know that moment? It's like, oh my goodness, they're everywhere. He's walking around the city. He sees one, I two. Okay, there's idols galore. Idols everywhere. And they had idols for everything. Everything. Every, you know, gods and goddesses, everything. Had an idol. You and I, we have an app for everything, right? Uh, they had an idol for everything. There's an idol for that. There's an idol for that. So that's what they had. He's inundated. He's noticing all of this. And really quick, when it comes to idols, when we think about that, it's so easy for us to be like, ha! Those people, man, that primitive little village, you know, they have their little idols. That's so, that's so cute. But us, we're so much more sophisticated. Like, we don't do that anymore. That's for the, those people out in the jungle. No, but let's not dismiss idol worship as something that happens just in the primitive villages and jungles and tribes. No, this is something that we all deal with. This is something that's very, idol worship is very much alive and active <laughs> in our culture today. You see, anything that we look to to provide for us what only God can, I mean, that by definition can be an idol. I mean, things like um, money, food, sex, entertainment. I mean, the, all, a lot of different things can be considered idols. The clothes that we wear, the car that we drive, the place where we live. If you're me, it's a Super 73 e-bike, but don't worry about that. Just pray for me. <laughs> These things can be idols. It could be a relationship. It could be, I want to be a parent. Oh, it's my spouse, or it's my kids. It's my possessions. I mean, hey, even church, religion, and Christian service can become an idol. You see, when we take a good thing and we turn it into a God thing, we have fashioned an idol. When something other than God occupies the place of God, that's an idol. So for us, it may not be the little tiny statue, or like the little one-foot gold, silver, wood statue. It could be something other, but when we take a good thing and we make it a God thing, we are worshiping an idol. So let's not just dismiss the idol thing. Okay, we're learning about history here. We are, but let's not dismiss idol worship as just something that us as a sophisticated society does not deal with. So that's what Paul saw. Paul saw. Paul saw. That's what he saw. Uh, what did he feel? What did he feel? It says his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. 
So what did he feel? Provoked. And really that word provoked is kind of, it's too soft. It's too soft of a word because really the word there that, that it gets translated provoked, it really means like it was deeply troubling. He was deeply troubled. You see, Paul was a Jew. He spent his entire life growing up as a Jewish man. And if you know anything about Judaism, it's a very monotheistic religion. It's about one God. And so it's being in a place where there's this plurality and just countless gods everywhere. That was deeply, deeply troubling to him. And he's going to do something about it. So the next thing is, what did Paul do? What did Paul do? Verse 17. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. So first we see he goes to where the people are. He goes to where the people are. He, like, uh, notice he didn't rage on them. He didn't explode on them and blow a gasket. You idol worshipers! How dare you! No, he, he goes to where people are and he begins to reason with them. He, where, where did he go? He went to the synagogue, which is very, very Paul-like to start out with the synagogue. And he reasoned with the Jews there, the God-fearing Gentiles, and then he made his way to the marketplace. And when you and I think of marketplace, we think of, you know, where you go, you know, get your, like, buy some food, some vegetables, you know, what what comes to my mind is I think of where Aladdin stole the bread, you know, okay. Uh, And so we think of, like, oh, that's the marketplace. But for them, the marketplace was the center of culture. I mean, you and I, we have our phones, and when we want to, like, you know, see what, what's going on in the world, what's the news and all that, what's the latest? I mean, they had the marketplace where they would go and they could, they could talk and share with one another, what's the latest ideas, what's going on, what's, what's going on in this world? And notice that he goes and he, he reasons. When you reason with someone, it's not yelling, you know, and, and just, you know, anger, yelling. No, he, it's a conversation, it's back and forth. It's, let me put myself in your shoes and understand your argument from your position. Let me, like, it's, it's like, it's, it's, so it's calm. He's reasoning with them. and says, verse 18, and some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Okay, who are these guys? And if you're a philosopher, you're gonna be like, Matt, that was way too simplistic. Uh, you, you didn't really give it justice, but I'm just gonna be simplistic here. Um, I mean, these are just different uh, philosophies of the time. The Epicureans, they were all about, if you had to like, kind of boil it down to a nutshell, they're all about seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. Like, dude, if, if it makes you happy, like, that's the right way to live. And if you have a Stoic, you know, we, we understand the Stoic, they're very, like, removed, and there's, like, the thief, uh, thief deep thoughts, think deep thoughts, and about nature, and, and the existence of, of God, like, he's gotten all of nature, and so it's v- this, this thought, idea of, like, um, uh, virtue and, and behaviors, they were very much about that, so virtue signaling has been around for a really long time, too, and so notice what they're saying. He says, what they were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities, because he was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. So they called him an idol babbler. How offensive. An idol babbler. Have you ever been, have you, I mean, you guys have been in those places and at times where you're the one, you're, just, you're talking, you're sharing sincerely about, about your faith, perhaps, and people just give you weird looks, like, what in the world are you talking about? You're crazy. Well, dude, you're in good company. You're in great company if that's, if that's the case. You can think about it. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest authorities on Christianity, who is re- alone responsible for writing over a quarter of the entire New Testament. I mean, this is the guy that, I mean, we, we look to, we're, we study his, his writings, and he is being called an idle babbler, a blabbermouth. And notice what they were really hung up on. He seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So notice that this is not some vague notion of God. You know, you can take a very open-ended, nebulous, vague notion of God, and you can go and preach that anywhere. You can walk into any, any place and, and start talking about, oh, God, this, like, yeah, God, God. It's very, very neutral. You're not going to get a lot of pushback. Um, and that, for them, they're like, okay, they come and talk about it. You know, for them, it's like, oh, we have our philosophies, our deep, deep understandings of the world and nature, and we get all that. But, okay, this Jesus guy, 
This resurrection, okay, that's some strange stuff. That is some strange stuff. And they took him, so he has their, you know, there's curiosity. They took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming for you're bringing some strange things to our ears and we want to know what these things mean. And so it's kind of cool. What you see is that they are curious. There's a curiosity there. And Paul didn't have to go and kick down doors like, listen to me and, and force his way into things like d- demand their attention. He was just sharing with them. There was curiosity that was stirred up. Verse 21 Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. I mean, this is how they entertained themselves. Again, you and I, we have our social media, endless scrolling of social media and then sharing memes. You know, that's how we get caught up on things. And we, they didn't have that. They had the marketplace, and then there was this other place where, this, where they would really hash out a lot of these ideas and philosophies. The Oropagus. And so Paul is there. He's in front of this group of spiritually curious people. And let's look at now what he said. What did Paul say? He says, verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. So what's he doing there? Really, I mean, he's kind of like giving them a compliment. He's giving, he's starting on common ground. He's saying, I see you. I see you. You you are for sure religious. And I get that. I mean, as I'm cruising around, I've seen all of the different, different statues and all of that stuff. I can tell you guys are clearly religious. It's very, very clear that belief in something, in someone, is very, very, very important to you. It's a big deal. You've got all of those statues. It's, you have a very obvious religious fervor. So it's kind of this common ground, calling it out, a little bit of a compliment Verse 23, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So you see, he starts with common ground. The next thing that we see is that he's engaging the culture. He's engaging the culture. He doesn't run away from the culture. A lot of times it's easy, like, oh, that's all the idol worship. I'm going to get as far away from that as possible. We don't see that. He engages it. He's looking for an opportunity, and he sees the, that, that, that altar to the unknown God. And he's like, that's it. I'm going to use that as a launch pad, as an opportunity in order to connect the gospel to this group. What a sweet open door. The unknown God. Well, that the altar to the unknown God, I'm going to make that God known to you. And I was just thinking about it too, like what does it say about this group, this people, the fact that they had an altar to an unknown God? Probably means several things, but one of the things that stands out to me is that it reveals a certain level of insecurity, right? A certain level of insecurity and a sense of incompleteness, even with idols galore, idols for everything under the sun, there was still a sense of incompleteness. And I want to say that really is what you get apart from Jesus. You get a sense of incompleteness. There's not lasting satisfaction. There's always something missing. There's no rest. You have to keep searching. You have to keep seeking. You have to keep shopping for something that will satisfy and that, that light, that's exhausting. When it's always about, where's the next thing? Or the next, what's the next thing that's going to satisfy? And for, for, the, for the people of Athens, this unknown God, it really revealed a level of insecurity and incompleteness. And so they had this contingency God. It's like, we got all these things covered, okay, but just in case, because it oh, doesn't seem like this is enough. Let's just have something that's here for anything that we're missing. Kind of the catch-all. The just-in-case God. We don't necessarily know this God, but there is this, there's this sense that there's something else out there, something more. So Paul capitalizes on this. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. And so he's like, let me tell you about this unknown God. So he starts with establishing some common ground. 
He engages the culture. Now he's going to make known the unknown. He's going to challenge their concept, their understanding of who God is. And my really, my hope and prayer that this morning is that as we go through this, what he shares with them as he's making known the unknown God is that you and I too, perhaps we have thoughts about God that need to be challenged. And so may this challenge our thoughts if there's a sense of incompleteness that we are carrying into our understanding of God. Verse 24, he starts, he clarifies who God is and who he's not. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with human hands. And so what's cool is he starts out with creation, takes them all the way back to the beginning, and just in just a moment, he's going to jump back into creation. But notice what uh, the other thing that he says there. He says that, that God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. It's obvious kind of what he was doing with them in that time. Like these are all these, cre- you know, these creations, these statues, these things, these, you know, temples, all that stuff. But let me tell you, the God, the unknown God I'm making known to you, he doesn't dwell in any of that. And I think for us too here today, it's important for this truth to sink in. You see, I think that there's, there's still like an under, um, whether it's explicitly stated or, you know, there's, there are times where we think that being here in this building, here in this room, that there's something about being here that makes us closer to God. That, that we, we feel like, okay, we're, we're getting a little bit closer. This is where, where God seems to dwell. So it feels extra spiritual to be at a church building. You know, we, we, if you're paying attention, you'll hear this. And, and I, I'm, I do it too. It's kind of been baked into the cake in many ways of just my upbringing is that we've, we've looked at like this being more spiritual and we get closer to God when we're physically at a church building. And the question is, what is that? What are we doing in that moment when we are functioning that way? And I, I think what we're doing there, whether we realize it or not, is that we're mingling the old and the new. We're mingling the Old and the New Testament. We are tangling the temples, if you will. We're tangling them up. You see, in the Old Testament, while there was still an understanding that God couldn't be contained within a physical place, there was still the temple in the Old Testament that where the temple had the Holy of Holies, and that's where God was known to dwell, the Holy of Holies. But then you fast forward, and on this side of the cross, this side of the resurrection, this side of, of the ascension, and then this side of, the, of Pentecost, where God sends his spirit, is that we now, Christians, you are the temple. We are the temple. You are, if you have Christ in you, you are the Holy of Holies. How many of us think of ourselves like that? I, you know, Christ dwells in me. I'm the Holy of Holies. No, we tend to think I'm still dirty and like, ah. Uh, but no, we're, we're, we have to untangle our understanding of the temples. See, when you come to trust Jesus as your Savior, he comes to dwell in you. Your heart, where Christ dwells, that is the Holy of Holies. I mean, I've said it before, but a Christian is a person who has Christ in. Christian, Christ in. And you see, this whole thing that we are a part of is not about getting people into a building, but about Christ getting into people. That's where he dwells. Verse 24, the, or 25. So he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Okay, this is huge. Because Christians, we do, we do this a lot, right? We love to talk about serving God. Like, we love serving God. Are you serving God? Are you living for Him? Are you, and honestly, we, we talk about, I, I want to serve God. I want to do great things for God, for the kingdom. I want, I want to serve Him. And I remember just growing up singing songs about that, and we still, many times, like, we'll sing these songs about how great our service to God is, I remember growing up, and, you know, I saw, I, my, one of my favorite songs was about being in the Lord's army. You know, I'm not going to sing it for you, because <laughs> then it'll be stuck in your head. It's actually a good song. No, but it's about, I'm, gonna, I'm in the Lord's army. I'm serving him. And I think with all of this, there's this sense that 
it's almost as to suggest that God is incomplete, that he needs something from me. There's something lacking about who God is, and my service is a way of kind of just helping to fill that need, helping God get to where he's supposed to be. And we call that, I'm going to glorify him. I'm going to get him to where he's not because he's lacking. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me. Our God is not needy. And we put all kinds of pressure on ourselves to perform for God, to perform, to, to think of like, uh, like you know, he's, he's lacking in some kind of way, but there is no pressure. The pressure's off. He's not served by human hands as though he needed anything. So let me ask you, as you think about your understanding of who God is, do you picture him as needy? Is he a needy God? Is he up there in heaven? Is he frustrated with you with your lack of spiritual progress, your lack of spiritual production? Are you doing enough? Is he frustrated with you? Or are you on the hook to perform and provide something that he is lacking? Or let me ask you this. Is your God complete? Is he complete and is he content with the you that he has made you to be? It's a big difference. See, is our God, is he a giver or is he a, a taker? Our answers to these questions, questions like this, they're, they're important. Our questions, our answers to questions like this will really shape, and in many ways, shape the way that we live. The way that we answer that question, the way we understand who God is, it's going to be the, shape the way that we live. The idea of knowing God and making him known, well, what if our knowing of God is a distortion? What if it's based on a lie or a faulty premise? then that, that's the God that we're going to go make known. I'll tell you, for a long time in my Christian walk, the God that I n knew was not a God that I wanted to make known. I wasn't experiencing any satisfaction. So why would I want to make you as miserable as I felt? <laughs> that's not loving. But there was that pressure. I'm telling you, when we understand and we, we understand who God is, there's going to be a, a, just an, an innate sense of, I have to share this with others. I have to share who he is. I want to make him known. So he's not a taker. He's a giver. Our God does not, God does not need you, but he desires you. He's a giver. He himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. So moving ahead, verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habit habitation. So Paul here, he ret returns back to that theme of creation. And you know, one of the biggest, you know, ongoing debates that has, has really pervaded, uh, permeated like our world and our culture is really the, the debate of origins the debate, the origin of humanity, right? I mean, it's been around for a long time. Like, how did we get here? Where did we come from? And there's been so many people and books and, and philosophies and ideas and things that have tried to poke holes in the biblical account of creation. There's been all kinds of, you know, of debates that have, have, have gone on. People have been trying to explain away Genesis, so like it's just an allegory, or whatever it might be. So we, we live in a world today where like there's so much debate around that. So we have a bunch of people that are believing that we came from some like primordial soup. We've got kids being taught that, well, oh, don't worry, we just came, we were a little fish that went, we, we became apes, and eventually we became what we are today. And that really, it's like, that's called a secular humanistic philosophy there. And really, that kind of secular humanism, that belief, it might be interesting to think about and pontificate and be like, it's kind of, oh, it's interesting and intriguing. But here's the thing. It will fail. At some point, it will fail to make sense of the world that we live in. It doesn't possess the resources to answer certain questions about the world that we live in. I mean, even just, just a, the last couple of years, with all of the, 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 the discussion and, and debate around justice. I mean, where does that even come from? Where does this, like, this idea that there needs to be justice, I mean, all of that, that craving, that desire for justice, it all assumes that there is an actual right and wrong. 
in a naturalistic world, it can't make sense of our need and our desire for justice. I mean, if there's no creator God who's the ultimate source of, of truth and morality and right and wrong, I mean, if we're all here by accident, why should we even care? Why should I even care? Why should you care about making things right, about a sense of justice? It's really, it's pointless. It doesn't have legs to stand on. But here's the thing. We do care. Our world cares. There's a, a Russian philosopher named Vladimir Solvyov. I think I said it the right way. And who somewhat uh, sarcastically summarized the, the ethic of, of uh, secular humanism this way. He said, man descended from apes, therefore we must love one another. And we, we laugh and we see like the irony there, like that that second phrase doesn't follow from the first. I mean, if it was perfectly natural for the strong to eat the weak in the past, like why aren't people allowed to do that now? Why aren't people allowed to do that now? But somehow we know that it is wrong. You see, we live in a world that is filled with inescapable realities, inescapable truths, things like right and wrong, truth and justice, love and beauty. These things are, they're, again, baked into the cake that we understand innately these things. And these are things that are all a part of creation, a creation that declares the glory of God. Paul was tapping into this, and when he wrote to the Romans, he said this in Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I like to think of like this world, this creation is just like a gigantic scavenger hunt. You know, whether you stick your eye into a telescope or a microscope or whether you look at morality, you just look, look around and observe of the things, it's a big scavenger hunt that all points people to the creator. And this is what Paul is, is tapping into. Back in uh, verse 27, he says that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. He says, seek after God, pursue him. The unknown God, he can be known. He can be known, and he's not far from each one of us. If he's not far from each one of us, where is he? Well, for the believer, he's in you. He's in us. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said. I like that. He's tapping into their songwriters, their poets, like he's going, engaging their culture. Here's, here's where you guys have, are familiar. You're grasping at these ideas. You know, there's a little kernel of truth there. I'm going to leverage that, tap into it. He uses their poets. And he says, uh, for, for we also are his children, for in him we live and move and exist. Like, what does that phrase, what does that phrase mean? I mean, I think we as Christians here, if you are a Christian, there, there's a, it's entirely possible that we operate under an assumption or a standpoint of separation. Here's what I mean. We will we'll tend to think of my, my relationship with God. That God is, he's far out there. He's out there. He's up there. God's, oh, he's, he's there. And I'm, I'm firing out my long distance prayers uh, to him. I hope he answers them. But he's way, way out there. There's a lot of separation uh, between God and I. But I'm thankful that he listens. And every now and then I get this answer to prayer. And I'm like, dude, sweet. God's so faithful. That's awesome. Thank you so much, God in heaven. Way up there, God. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm going to hit you up again when I have another prayer. But thank you for being you. And we, there's this separation, right? What are we missing? What are we missing? Well, he's right here. He's right here. He is our life. He's in us. He's with us. We are in him. We are with him. You see, we, as believers, we do not operate from a standpoint of separation. We talked about tangling the temples. This is tangling the testaments you know, we like the, the old and the new. You see, a lot of the people we call heroes in the Old Testament, they prayed prayers like David. He prayed a prayer of, God, please do not leave me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't abandon me. They prayed prayers like that in, 
in the New Testament, this side of the cross, this side of the resurrection, we have something far, far better. You see, we don't operate anymore from a standpoint of separation, but of union, of union. We are one. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. You see, Christ is our life. He's not just a piece of our life. You know, he's not just a piece of life. He's our life. He's not just the, the biggest slice of pie in my, my, my pie of life. He's not just the biggest slice. He's the crust. Sorry, that was a little cheesy, but you guys get the point. He's the, he's the all in all. And this really, because again, we live and move and exist in him and he in us. This is the, really the beauty of the gospel. And we miss it. We miss the beauty of the gospel when we just leave Jesus on the cross. We say, okay, thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing on the cross. You're dying for me. That's fantastic. And God, thank you in heaven. One day I'll be there with you and I can fire my prayers to you. Okay, thank you and thank you. I mean, we, we're operating from separation, but that's not, that's not the full gospel. When we, my question is, where is, where is the Christ in you? Where is the Christ as your life? You see, the, the gospel is much better than some, some help from heaven. You know, that's separation. My question is, where is the union? Where is the you being united to Christ in his death, united to Christ in his resurrection? Where is that in his burial and in his resurrection? And do we realize that we have been raised with Jesus We've been seated with him, that we are joined to him so that in him you live and you move and you have your being. See, we're not just talking about help from heaven. We're talking about Christ in you, the only hope of glory. So this is not a partial gospel. This is the full gospel. Verses, verse 29, he says, being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. So in a city bursting with gold, silver, stone, idols, and statues, Paul is, is making known the unknown God. He's like, the, the God that we're talking about here is not the result of someone's creative, imaginative work. He's not something that we invented. He's not something that we created. But this is what humanity has done. Certainly what the Athenians had done, trying to reduce God into this physical object. And Paul sees this and he says, really the time, you might have been ignorant up until now, <laughs> but the time of ignorance is over. It's time to repent. Verse 30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, Thank you, God, for doing that. <laughs> God is now declaring to men that all people, all people, this is not just a select few, a small little group of people over here, or this, it's, it's all people everywhere that they should all repent. And I know that some people, we might have an allergic reaction to the word repent. It depends on how the, the tone of voice that it's said. Repent! Um, I don't know, maybe that's just my story. But repent is actually a beautiful thing. Repent means to change your mind. It means I was thinking this, I was believing this, the truth came, and now I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose to change my mind, and I'm going to believe the truth. And when that lie comes back, I'm going to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to believe that. I'm, I'm, it's, so repentance is ongoing. It's a changing of the mind, and here's the thing. It's not just a mental game. Repentance, a changing of our mind, will produce a change of action. It will change the way that we live because we're going to walk. We're going to be consistent. We're going we're to be consistent with the, the truth that we, we claim and what we've repented from and what we're going to choose to believe. We're going to live consistently with that. And when we're not, we're just going to repent of that. We're going it, to, again, we're, this is the process is of, it's the process of renewing our minds. It's not an overnight thing. So, uh, verse 31. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There's a lot that we could say about that passage, but again, I just want you to notice, there it is. It's Jesus and the resurrection. It's Jesus and the resurrection. 
You see, again, we can preach a vague, nebulous, open-ended uh, version of God, this nebulous God, and that will be just perfectly fine. People aren't going to be offended. They're going to be, that's really great. That's cool. That's kind of what I believe, too. That's, that's fantastic. Um, and we can add a God like that to our big theater of statues. Oh, dude, that's, oh, the way that you said that about God, yeah, I'll put that. That's going to be a, an addition to my statue collection, my idol collection. But Jesus and his death and his resurrection, that will draw that proverbial line in the sand. And that's what we see. We, we see that there's people who, who begin to sneer because of that. So let's look at the reaction and the result. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, verse 32, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So there was some sneering. It was a very mixed bag, right? There was some sneering going on. Like, what are you talking about? You're crazy. And there's others like, this is kind of interesting. We're going to hear some more about this. And I like that Paul, he's not trying to land the plane. You know, he's, he's just going to be about Jesus, the cross, the resurrection. And then he's just, okay. And then he pieces out. <laughs> what was the result? Verse 34. But some men joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysius, the Aragop, I can't say that word right now, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Well, that's awesome. You see, like, there was this, it wasn't fruitless. It was awesome. You, you, you never know. Here's the thing. When you talk about Jesus, you make much of Jesus, the cross, and the resurrection. And again, it's not just the Jesus that, oh, I need to go and serve. I need to serve that Jesus. There's, again, we can talk about Jesus and still kind of be trapped in that, that standpoint of separation, that Jesus is over there, and I'm following him. He's out ahead of me. I'm following him. I'm doing good. And, oh, I'm not doing so good. No, no. When we talk about Jesus and the resurrection, we talk about who he is, his life in us, and we're expressing his life through us. When we talk about that, we, you know, that, that really is, is what Paul is doing. He's pointing to Jesus and the resurrection, the cross and the resurrection. Some people will hear that, and they will think you're weird. They will think you're crazy. But there might be a few who hear that, and they don't hear foolishness. They don't hear crazy, but they hear the very words of life that God in that moment, the Holy Spirit in that moment, uses what you say as you point to Jesus and you clumsily talk about the cross and the resurrection. You stumble over your words that God uses even that to, to activate faith, to be the words of life to someone listening. What's cool is that it's not our job to convince. We simply point to Jesus we highlight, we underscore, we emphasize, and we leave the results to God. So what have we seen? What has Paul done here? We saw that he, he found common ground. He didn't fight. He didn't fight with them. He met them where they were at. He engaged the culture. He uses pieces of their story of things that they understood, and he used that to point to the one true God. He took the unknown God. He made known the unknown God. He showed that there's forgiveness for the sin of idolatry by looking to Jesus, the cross, the resurrection. And so, Christian, let me ask you this this morning. Let me ask you again. Who is your God? As you think about, as you relate to God, who is your understanding of God? Who is he? Again, is he needy? Is he frustrated with you? Is he angry? Is he annoyed with your, your lack of commitment, your lack of spiritual production and progress? Or is he complete? Is he content with the new creation that he has created you to be? Is he content? Is he a taker or is he a giver? Is he far off and he's aloof and distant or is he near? Is he close? Are you relating to him from a standpoint of separation of I need to work my way to him, work my way to closeness with him? Or are you living from the reality of union? Union that is true about you on your best day and your worst. That does, it can't affect the union. Are you relating to God in that way? Is he just a God of, of 
uh, forgiveness, once upon a time forgiveness, and then he's a God of a future in heaven? Or is he your life? Christ in me, right here, right now. You see, the unknown God can be known. The unknown God can be known. And many of us here in this room, watching online, watching outside, many of us have been searching relentlessly. We've been searching and shopping for life, shopping for abundant life in our perpetual sense of incompleteness, our relentless seeking and searching and shopping for that which will satisfy that will only fully and finally be resolved by looking to Jesus. He is the life. He who has the Son has the life. See, the abundant life is not a thing. It's a person. It is Jesus. It's his life. It's not, and he's not something that we, we get by achieving, but by receiving. And he's not the reward that we get that, at the end of all of our trying but he's the reward that we get in trusting him. And when you come to know God, when you and I come to know the unknown God, we realize that there is no more need to search and shop. We have everything that we need in Jesus, and that's Jesus plus nothing. You know, what we do, when we take the Lord's Supper, communion, which we're going to do right now, this is what we remember, this is what we celebrate, is that we have all that we need in Christ. That He is all that we need. In the same way that we don't, we don't get Jesus by achieving, but by receiving Him, receiving His life. I mean, the same thing we're going to do is, is receive these elements. We're not going to work for it. We're not going to try to achieve it. We're going to receive it. And it's a picture of receiving the life of Jesus so when you get a chance, open this up and make sure you open the uh, wafer first and not pour the juice all over yourself. But Jesus instituted this, the Lord's Supper, and he pointed to the bread. He said, this is my body given for you. This is my body given for you. Again, we celebrate not our work for God and how we are doing, but his work for us and what he has done. When Jesus was with his disciples, he said, do this in remembrance of me. This is not do this in remembrance of you and all your hard work that you've done to perform for God. <laughs> this is not something we do and even to remember our failures and how much, you know, how much we fail. This is in remembrance of him. So do this in remembrance of me. And so let's take it and eat. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this, this is my blood. I'm, start, I'm starting something new. This is a new covenant. And my blood will always remind you that you are fully and finally forgiven. You see, we live in an apology-based kind of world, Right? You forgive me as long as I'm sincere and I come to you and I tell you with tears in my eyes how sorry I am. I'm so sorry. Jesus, God, he operates in a different kind of economy. It's not an apology-based one. It's a blood-based economy. There's no forgiveness of sins apart from the shedding of blood. And guess what? Jesus shed his blood. And it wasn't just for a little bit of your sins. It was once for all. And so we're going to we take this right now as fully forgiven people on our best day, on our worst day, we don't have to question our forgiveness. The, G the blood of Jesus worked. So let's toast to the finished work of Jesus.